So I'll just continue now. But I need to turn more this way so my double chin doesn't chip. Okay, um, so I originally conducted a statewide study of family Alzheimer's and dementia caregivers in Indiana. And the goal was really to look at issues of grief and loss experienced um, by family caregivers. And the study sample ended up being 429 caregivers um, across the state of Indiana. And they uh, completed, and I'll talk about the instrument a little bit later on, the Marwick Muser Caregiver Grief Inventory, as well as the coping questionnaire that I had um, generated. And from that study, just a little bit of the, the summary data, about 39% of the caregivers in the study were spouse caregivers. Over half of them were adult child and a few child-in-law and a few other, and other being usually like a sibling caring for the person with dementia. Uh, there were a few cousins or nieces or nephews also being the primary caregiver. Um, what was most interesting to me, I'm primarily uh, more of a qualitative researcher. I will do mixed methods, and that's what this study really was, but um, I'm always kind of interested in digging into the why of things. And um, good quantitative data can give you a really good picture of things, but can't always get at the why are the patterns showing up the way they are, which um, is sort of what makes me more passionate about the, the qualitative. So there was an open-ended question on the, um, on one of the instruments that were administered to all the caregivers, asking them what the biggest barrier is that they feel they face as a caregiver. And um, we had over 350 responses to the question. And what turned out to be extremely interesting and really started to, to push me much more in a grief and loss direction is that three-fourths of the caregivers who responded to this question responded in some way that related to loss or grief. And um, a few of the examples uh, in terms of what is the biggest barrier you faced as a caregiver, um, one person said the hopelessness and f finality of the disease. And someone else said letting go of the person that we used to know. Um, both statements directly connect to grief and loss issues. And I was really amazed at just how prevalent that theme seemed to be among caregivers. And so I started to research and investigate more the, the concepts of anticipatory grief and ambiguous loss. And um, anticipatory grief uh, is defined by uh, Rando, the, the researcher who um, came up with the concept, as the grief or mourning that's experienced while the care recipient is still alive, because you're going through a mourning process and a process of loss. A related term to anticipatory grief is the concept of psychosocial death. Um, and uh, Doka, a well-known uh, death researcher, um, had defined that term as the persona of the individual is so changed that others experience the loss of the person as he or she previously existed. And if any of you have had any experience um, with dementia, uh, someone in your family or caregiving, you can certainly relate to that concept of, of psychosocial death. One thing about anticipatory grief is that, that they even note that the concept's a little bit of a, of a, of a misnomer because um, anticipatory grief really encompasses grief that you've already experienced, grief that you're going through now, and also what you're anticipating going through in the future in terms of um, loss and challenges as your loved one um, declines further. Um, and very much related to uh, anticipatory grief is the concept of ambiguous loss. And um, Pauline Boss, um, who will be speaking at, at NCFR next month, yay, so I'm going to her session, <laughs> um, is, is really the, the cornerstone person for ambiguous loss. And uh, ambiguous loss really is a, a component or a piece of this anticipatory grief. And ambiguous loss is generally described as coming in, in one of two forms. Um, what she sums up as the leaving without saying goodbye, 
And uh, an example of the leaving without saying goodbye is um, when you have someone um, uh, go missing in action, maybe in war, or disappear, a uh, family member disappear. They're physically gone. So the description is they're physically gone, but psychologically still very present with you all the time. Um, and then the goodbye without leaving really is the flip side of that. The person is still um, physically there, but is um, um, psychologically or, or the person that you knew is not so much present anymore. And the goodbye without leaving is, is usually very much attributed to dementia and, um, and Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So the instrument that I had used um, is the Marwit and User Caregiver Grief Inventory, MMCGI. And it was specifically designed to look at grief and loss among dementia caregivers, among family caregivers. Um, and what they found was there were really kind of three different aspects to, bless you, um, to uh, grief. And uh, the dimensions that they were looking at were uh, heartfelt sadness and longing, which um, contains the, the interpersonal aspects of caregiving, uh, really gets at, um, questions get at feelings of loss and um, examining uh, the levels of longing for how life used to be. And then worry and felt isolation. Um, addresses uh, difficulties or issues facing the present and the present caregiving situation, um, feelings of isolation that may exist from society and from other family members, and then the personal sacrifice burden aspect of grief um, is what has the person given up uh, in terms of uh, sleep, energy, work time, uh, goals uh, to care for their family member. Okay, so with that background in mind and with some of those, the findings from that study in mind was that I, I found from that previous study um, there, was a, there was a small proportion of, of the caregivers from that uh, 429 sample who were caring for um, a loved one specifically with young or early onset dementia. And uh, it began to dawn on me, I thought, I wonder if the grief issues are different. I would think that maybe they would be, the grief and loss issues, because of some of the comments and statements being made by um, people caring for their loved one who was 50 years old who had dementia. Um, and I thought, I I'm really curious about that, um, sort of capturing that grief and loss and whether or not there, there is a, a quantifiable difference in the type of grief and loss experienced. And also um, really acknowledging the fact that I was pretty darn sure that the people going through the, the early onset dementia themselves were experiencing some kind of grief and loss and could express that. Um, and so I wanted to look at the, the, the care partners. And the reason why the study mentions them as uh, care partners um, is that, um, well, the parameters of the study were such that I would have had it be any family member that was the, the major caring person, a caregiver. And um, that more recently in the literature, especially with dementia and Alzheimer's, that uh, caregiver is being um, phased out a little more or is not as, as PC as care partner um, because care partner implies more of an active role with, of both people in that process rather than you are the sole recipient, you are the needy helpless person and I am caring for you. So it's thought to be a little bit uh, more empowering. Um, okay. The, an interesting thing in, uh, in terms of young or early onset dementia is that uh, in 2006, the Alzheimer's Association had estimated between 220,000 and 640,000 people in the U.S. under the age of 65 had young or early onset dementia. Huh, that's a, quite a broad span. And the reason for the, the huge difference in the numbers is different sources really had different um, uh, different sources had different uh, ways of gathering the data and um, hence the discrepancy in the, um, 
and different measures being used. Yes. Interesting, and that's fascinating. I, I, I should read more ab about that because I've heard uh, there is a, a growing body of literature, especially about the sense of smell, mm -hmm. and um, which is disturbing to me because I lost my sense of smell like eight years ago, and I smell nothing. And so there's a part of me that's avoiding that literature. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'm just like, wow, I, I don't know, I wanna know that. Um, but because I can't smell peanut butter. No, I can't smell anything, but okay. Um, so far, so good, knock on particle board. Um, uh, <laughs> but thanks for the insight. Um, <laughs> the, the, that's okay. The causes of uh, the young onset dementia um, can be Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body disease, or frontotemporal dementia, and I had all of those um, within my, um, my research study. Um, and Alzheimer's disease being the most uh, common um, form of dementia, and then Lewy body disease, which um, I'm sorry because I don't know it as well, which is a, a neurodegenerative disorder that causes um, uh, dementia but also tends to be hallucinations, movement, and gait disorders and affects a different part of the brain. Yes, yes. Yes. That's what I just saw a patient in ER, you know, this Monday, and I took my daughter because she got allergy in her eye. And this patient was on uh, after 10 minutes, 15 minutes, we hear a scream, and this was a patient with no body. That's interesting. And then the, the frontotemporal dementia, um, there's, there's several different types of uh, FTDs. And there can be different issues that come along with different types of dementia because of the parts of the brain that they, they affect. Too much noise in the hallway. Uh. <laughs> okay, so for the study itself, my uh, inclusion criteria was that the person, um, th the caregiver, family member participating in the study needed to be the primary caregiver and needed to be a relative, whether that's spouse, parent, sibling, or adult child. And primary caregiver being self-defined self as the primary caregiver uh, because there were a lot of possible um, measures or ways of defining primary caregiver. It could have been number of hours you spend, blah, blah, blah. But um, I went with the self-definition because usually people have more of a sense of I, I'm the primary caregiver for that person. Um, that the person had to have a formal diagnosis of some form of uh, young onset dementia and that the care partners needed to live together um, out in the community. And um, so what had shown up in my study were uh, early onset Alzheimer's, uh, primary progressive aphasia, PPA, and frontotemporal dementia of an unspecified type. And within this study, there were uh, two study populations. My group A was my national uh, study population. And so I sought uh, having participants from all over the U.S. who were uh, who fit the the three criteria on the the previous page, and were uh, caring for a loved one with young onset dementia. Um, I mailed the survey instruments. I no, okay because uh, I thought I should talk a little bit about recruitment and I couldn't remember if that was the next slide or not. Uh, mailed the survey instruments and then I either did follow up emails with them or with the, the person with dementia, the family member that they were caring for. Um, and then my group B participants um, were 10 care pairs, as I call the care bears, um, from Indiana. Um, at this time I was living in Indiana and so they went through the, the same they completed the same instruments 
as the caregivers from all over the U.S. But then the second piece of that was that I requested doing uh, in-home interviews with the caregiver and the person with dementia and, uh, and did do that. Okay, recruitment was very interesting for the study. Um, the Indiana University Alzheimer's Disease Center was extremely helpful uh, through their uh, support groups and their, their research center in helping me recruit uh, the Greater Indiana Chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. Also, the uh, Washington University in St. Louis has a huge Alzheimer's Research Center, and um, they were very willing to allow me to recruit through their listserv. Uh, then there are a few websites as well that, that focus specifically on um, uh, young or early onset Alzheimer's. It was the alzheimerspouse.com and uh, formemory.org. Also, some word of mouth happened. I, I actually received some unsolicited emails. Uh, so here's this instrument. It got sent out to someone in Dallas, Texas, and they completed it and said, you know, I'm, I'm, I participate in a support group for spouses with people with young onset. And I, I brought, I talked about this there, and I gave them your email, so you may be hearing from a few people. Um, and truly, while, while that phase of the study is done, I would really like to continue to gather more and more data. So I would love to be continuing recruiting uh, another phase two of this study. Ooh. The recruitment itself was a slow process, uh, partially due to the Institutional Review Board process. Um, not so much in doing the, uh, in, in accessing the caregivers for the research, but in accessing the person with dementia or Alzheimer's for the research. And that the, the Institutional Review Board was extremely resistant to that and in some senses extremely uninformed uh, about dementia or Alzheimer's and saying, you know, they're, they're completely compromised, they're not gonna be able to talk to you. And, I beg to differ. Um, and in a few cases, you know, I went to their house and it was clear that the person with the, the early onset dementia was at a point where they couldn't verbalize well and they were not gonna be able to communicate with me. Well, I didn't try and do an interview with them. But um, the, the insightfulness of, of people who had the disease to communicate and tell about their experience was so important, and I'm so glad that I pushed really hard with IRB to, to get it done. Also because there was a second university helping with the recruitment, Indiana University had to have some approval in there as well, uh, slow response rate. Uh, a huge issue was the confusion about early stage versus early onset. And that's why uh, also the, the language was moved much more to young onset than early onset. Oh, oh, you mean people who are just getting Alzheimer's? No, I mean people who are younger um, and have young onset dementia being d defined by the, by the Alzheimer's Association as uh, dementia which, uh, whose onset occurs before the age of 65. And, um, so people, oh, my, my spouse is in the early stages of, no, 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 that's, mm. so um, having to be very clear and rewrite some documents and documentation and still even the, the communication sort of across email or by the time it makes it to a caregiver group may have um, been confused. And there was my crude map, but isn't it pretty? Um, <laughs> uh, of uh, lo low-tech Jackie of uh, all of the states that are in yellow or, or orange um, were states that I had caregiver responses from. So it was pretty well spread out through the US and all of the yellow states I had um, multiple caregivers uh, respond from. Who's more in denial, the person who suffers or the caregiver? I think the caregiver. Um, or at least that for the, the stage, the, fa the, the point in time of the people that I spoke to and the people with the, the young onset dementia um, were definitely uh, at a place where they were aware and they understood what the process was. But what was fascinating to me, which is why like, I really love to have more and more of these um, partners, it just so happened to turn out that it was all spouses that um, from, from the care pairs, 
Um, it wasn't my intention to necessarily have it be all spouse caregivers, but the, um, the, the strong mutual concern for each other, because I interviewed them separately, um, so that they sort of wouldn't, wouldn't taint each other's interview. And, and the, the people with the young onset dementia were experiencing grief and loss themselves, but some of that was very much toward their, their partner of the amount of, um, uh, I hate to use the word burden, but sometimes they use the word burden or stress caused on their, their, their partner um, through the disease process and knowing that I'm going to get worse and I'm going to become more and more dependent on her and she's such a wonderful spouse and you know I, I don't want to be that burden for her and so it's just it was just um, fascinating and very uh, in, insightful. So the demographic data for the, for the, the study, the, the mean caregiver age slash spouse age, um, actually that's not true for the, the, the national um, study, the mean age of the caregivers were uh, 57 and the person with dementia, the mean age was 60. Uh, the range for caregivers was uh, caregivers as young as 48 and as old as 67 and the person with the young onset dementia, the range was uh, 44 to 68. Um, because young onset dementia, which now we know more as familial and now they think may be a entirely different strain of dementia or may not be what we think of at all in terms of uh, Alzheimer's or uh, many of the dementias that we know something about, um, it, the, 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 sorry, the younger onset dementia tends to take a faster track. And so if someone uh, uh, is diagnosed with uh, younger onset dementia at 45 or 50 or 55, um, they're not that likely to be making it 10 or 15 years. Um, so some of, some of the people diagnosed were um, not diagnosed until they were 63, 64, so sort of on that, that borderline, but um, retroactively, um, retrospectively, uh, physicians looking back and family members looking back saying, yeah, there, there have been symptoms and signs and things going on for several years. It's not like this just came up now. Um, the care, caregivers, 71% uh, were female and 29% were male. Um, there were no same-sex couples, at least thus far, um, in the study. And um, the data that you're seeing here is coming from uh, 32 of the, the care partners so far, which are all spouses. I focused in on just the spouse data. And that their, their average length of time of caregiving uh, at the time that they responded uh, to the instruments had been th three years. Um, and the people participating with the early onset uh, have been seven people so far, four women and three men. And um, in terms of the grief and loss and going back to that uh, Marwit Muser Caregiver Grief Inventory, um, the highest mean scores related to these particular questions. Uh, or statements. I wish this was all a dream and I could wake up back in my old life. Uh, the mean score on that particular question was, uh, or statement was 4.77 on a 5.0 scale, which was um, very statistically significant in comparison to the mean of 3.85 for all caregivers in my statewide study. So starting to see certain areas where the, the, the younger, earlier onset um, care partners are woo, really responding strongly. And then also the I feel very sad about what this disease has done. Uh, 4.52 mean on a 5.0 scale comparing with a 4.07 mean for all caregivers in the statewide study. Um, and, okay, I'll go back on this. And what's interesting is now having, um, and I'm talking more about the qualitative stuff here than the quantitative. The, um, 
the dimension of the, the Marwit Muser Caregiver Grief Inventory, there's the, um, okay, I want to go back and show that. Do, 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 do. In those three dimensions, heartfelt sadness and longing, worry and felt isolation, and personal sacrifice and burden, in those three dimensions now, comparing uh, all dementia caregivers to the younger, earlier onset caregivers, is seeing the, the, the strongest difference is in the heartfelt sadness and longing. And there really have been some, some statistically significant findings in seeing higher rates of, um, of that grief and loss sense in the heartfelt sadness and longing, which, um, I mean, to me, it makes sense, but um, especially when you're thinking about someone younger having uh, dementia or Alzheimer's disease, the the where you are in the in the life course when it's impacting you and your family members, um, there were I the there were several people in the study who um, still had children at home. And so the dynamic of, of uh, and a few people having little children at home, there was one woman who was not in the smaller study, but was in the statewide study, um, who stands out to me because she did the uh, caregiver grief inventory instruments uh, related to her husband. And she sent a long letter in with um, the instruments and that she had cared for her husband who had uh, Alzheimer's disease for a number of years and now she was currently caring for her 39 year old daughter who had young onset Alzheimer's. So she's like, I've done this once and she's like, that was devastating enough and now to care for my daughter in this process. And I, oh my goodness gracious. Um, I thought I could do an entire study on just her alone. Um, and um, the amount of gratitude that both people with the young onset dementia and care partners who participated in the study seemed to have about people doing research on this topic. Just you know, sending me emails or sending a letter saying, this is so important. And, um, which I sort of knew in, in terms of, you know, in my gut that the, the impact that issues of grief and loss can have um, in terms of uh, seemingly its, its potential paralysis um, within uh, either the relationship or the caregiving process or both. And, um, and seeing just how much the sense of grief and loss permeates on both sides for both the person with uh, dementia and uh, their family member. Okay. So, oops, I'm sorry. Dee, I gotta go back to where I was. So the research here is ongoing, and um, while it's been put aside a little bit because of uh, all of my prison research. And uh, I would like to get back to this more and more because I think there's such a, a, a richness there of things to be examined. And um, I was in communication for uh, a while with one particular man who had young onset Alzheimer's disease. And he had been, uh, he lives in Nebraska and uh, Peter Beeson, and he had been, I think, a professor at the University of Nebraska and um, had young onset Alzheimer's and was very just profound. He writes a lot, he wrote a lot of poems, he told me I could certainly use these in my presentations, et cetera. So um, he had written one called Anger and Sadness. Yeah, I'm angry and sad, most every day, all day. It's just the way it is, it's the Alzheimer's way. The anger's not very specific, it's just like, just there like my memory isn't. Maybe it's just the daily frustration of all the coping and compensating. And of course, there's the stress. The moment to moment, day to day, struggle to deal with, the dis with disappearance. My slow slip, sliding further away. In so many ways, it is as if I'm not. Not really here anymore, evermore. Not really part of anything anymore. No longer really on the planet. 
and he was just so profound and, and we, we emailed back and forth for a while and to be able to, well obviously he is not someone that I, I interviewed and was not part of the, the, the spouse partner thing, um, his ability to kind of sum up the, those experiences in obviously a very poetic way. Um, one uh, of the coping issues or the coping mechanisms that seem to be uh, much more prevalent in young onset care partners uh, is is focus group <laughs> is support group um, caregiver support groups and okay that the number sort of sorry they may be a little off in their their um, listing that um, family members caring for someone with uh, uh, younger onset dementia were much more consistently uh, attending support groups than those who did not have the younger onset dementia. Um, 10 or 15 years ago, it was really difficult to find support groups that specifically were for younger onset dementia. And uh, as time went on, it became more evident that uh, family members dealing with a younger onset dementia had issues that uh, uh, an 85 year old spouse dealing with a 90 year old um, spouse who um, came down with Alzheimer's disease or a dementia in the last few years didn't. And so um, the Alzheimer's disease, all, the Alzheimer's Association um, really responded to that push for more, uh, trying to establish more uh, younger onset uh, caregiving uh, support groups. Um, the import, some of the important insights so far, and I'm just really now digging, digging into some of the, uh, all the interviews are tape recorded, and um, I, I did all of the interviewing myself. Um, I just, I'm one of those people who feels very strongly about the, the, the being there, if at all possible, and being able to see the subtlety of people's body language or how the, um, how the spouses interacted. Even though I interviewed them separately, they still, you know, they came to the door, they greeted me, they said, let's have coffee, then we'll um, do the interviews. Um, uh, how, how willing and able the people with the earlier younger onset dementia are um, to respond and be self-reflective. And um, I think that something that didn't necessarily surprise me, but was so glad to see and be able to like share with students and, and other people. Um, some of those interviews I think will really always stick with me and the insightfulness of the person sitting there saying, hey, you know, I, I may not be able to tell you what day it is right now, but I can sure tell you how I feel about what this experience is like. And being so insightful and uh, sort of almost Buddhist <laughs> about, uh, about all of this and me, you know, walking out their front door thinking, wow, why do I feel so affirmed in life every time I talk to someone with Alzheimer's disease? Um, uh, a, a second point, which would be a, a side study in and of itself, is uh, the level of willingness in both care partners to raise issues of intimacy and sexuality. Um, none of my questions related to that issue, uh, but almost all of the care partners brought it up. Um, and uh, I suppose it really makes sense since you're talking about they're, they're all married couples who have all been uh, together for a long time and then that's one thing that uh, is changing or there is concern for both partners about the, the level of intimacy and, and or sexuality in their relationship as the disease progresses. And um, the, the other instrument that I hadn't talked at all about uh, is the CDR. I had said that the, um, the participants, the, the care partners, the caregivers, all completed two instruments. And um, went, for the ones that I interviewed, they completed a third instrument called the CD, CDR, which, the, which is care, 
caregiver dementia rating scale. It comes out of Washington University in St. Louis and their med school and their Alzheimer's Center. And um, um, people who were uh, helping me with this research and helping me sort of step back and frame it said they thought it would be very important for me to get a sense of the caregiver's sense of how um, how their loved one um, rated in certain d dimensions related to uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So uh, there are six different dimensions in the clinical dementia rating. I should have brought copies of that. I'm sorry, I, now that I'm thinking about it. Um, like uh, interpersonal, daily tasks, blah, blah, blah. So, so it wasn't all like, okay, well, how impaired do you think your loved one is? Because it depends on the, on the dimension in the area that you're talking about. And what was very interesting is that uh, the caregiving spouses uh, possibly uh, overestimated the impairment of their uh, loved one rather than underestimating it um, based on them responding and, they, well, I, I don't know how, how communicative he or she is, and I don't know about this, I would tend to rate this lower. Um, so them seeing them as more impaired rather than what um, might show up on a, uh, a cognitive exam or, a, and it's like, well, that's interesting that, that the, the spouse's own perception is, is that of higher impairment. And is that because you, you know them that intimately well and you're so used to interacting with them. Um, that you would see maybe their function in some of these dimensions as lower than they would objectively score uh, on a test, so to speak. Um, another wonderful poem that will depress everyone uh, by, by Peter Beeson called Stressed and Depressed. Stressed, depressed. Stressed and depressed. Depressed and stressed. All of the above, all of the time, such is my life, what it's become, what Alzheimer's has done for me, to me, with me. And what's interesting is that um, in my communications with, with Peter, um, obviously the poems are not upbeat, uh, but he has always been uh, extremely driven to be very um, outspoken, be very involved in his uh, own care and his own disease process. And that's something that's also really stood out to me with younger, uh, earlier onset dementias rather than um, older onset dementia. The level of push and advocacy among people who get dementia at a younger age. If you look at a lot of the um, autobiographies of people who have dementia and Alzheimer's, it is almost exclusively young onset. Um, people with young onset who feel like, I need my story to be told, I, need, I want to volunteer for research because I want to still contribute and really strongly make a difference and have my voice heard. Um, and so in terms of ginormous conclusions from this research, uh, I'm still in process and in progress on it. I think there have been some um, amazing insights in terms of, um, again, the, the ability to communicate, the perspective of the person with the disease, their own concern um, about their partner, and, um, and not even necessarily the entire family dynamic, but, but their own partnership, uh, spousal connection, and what that might be like over time, and um, how they're still trying to, to balance things. And the amount of, and like I said, I, I interviewed the, the spouses separately, um, same day, same house, but uh, separately. And a lot of the same themes would come up uh, in terms of um, um, uh, the love and support for the other person, but they, them both very much putting the other person in the as their focus, so that the, the caregiving spouse would say, you know, Joe really is my, my life, and yes, some days it's exhausting, but um, he's my husband, and, you know, we're still at a point where we can go and enjoy things and do things, and we try and do that, um, and
and then talking to Joe saying, you know, my, my wife still is my partner. And uh, so having some of the same worries and concerns, but from, um, from both sides, from the, the view of, uh, and I think learning more and more about um, both sides can be really insightful on, on thinking ahead about um, family dynamics, about uh, counseling issues, about better uh, support groups, about uh, stronger programming um, as, as the disease progresses and, the, and the both partners have to deal with it. Um, so that's, that, 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 that's, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. Um, uh, questions, discussions, thoughts? I would add it, add it to this. Um, like I said, there's been a bit of a break on this research and doing more and more of the prison research. Um, but I would very much like to get back to this. And what's interesting too is that with Alzheimer's dementia and younger onset dementia, um, most of the, the scholarship that I found on the younger onset dementia was out of uh, England or Australia. Um, the US was very much further behind in terms of its research um, and thinking about um, uh, program development, et cetera. I thought, that's really, really interesting. And so after a while, it just sort of got to be a pattern that I thought, let me guess, this person somewhere in Australia, yep. So um, UK and Australia, um, I thought, I want to go to Australia and see what they're doing with um, younger onset dementia and, um, and f you know, family contacts and programming and because it seemed to be just sort of much farther along than, than where we are. Um, yes, I would very much like to continue this. I have some connections with uh, people at the Alzheimer's Disease Center uh, at Northwestern. Um, it's a little more difficult being downstate because if I'm gonna sort of schlep around to, to do interviews, then um, obviously I'm, I'm gonna be going a little bit further and, um, and redoing the, the Institutional Review Board um, stuff here, which I think, you know, the precedent's been set. I've already done this before. I think that I could get the approval again. Um, I figure at some point in time I'm going to end up studying people with Alzheimer's in prison and that will be the ultimate combination of, and there's actually some um, um, states that are, are really, uh, New York has done some really progressive stuff with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's in, in incarceration settings, um, which um, I'm like, ah. go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you that if you had any other experience hearing or, or meeting anyone at the Wabash Valley, and if, if you have or if you know of, Do you have about five hours? Um, um, like are they all put in a wing by, them, not by themselves, but to themselves? Also the caregiver could be in the, the institutional or is there yeah. in the Um And most, most states and places don't. Um, and that sort of seem, is obviously a problem because when dementia can, you know, there can be behavioral issues exhibited with dementia, and then you have correctional officers, some of whom are not that advanced, or uh, not that advanced mentally, um, who are then looking at you as like, you're a behavior problem. And now this is how I'm gonna to respond to the behavior problem as I might with a 19 year old who's just doing it to get at me. And it's like, well, you, you don't understand the, pr so educating um, correctional staff more about issues related to uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. The, um, um, what's been done at this particular prison in New York, because I thought, wow, this is such a progressive thing. The Department of Corrections partnered with the Alzheimer's Association at, I think it's, I think it's Fishkill. I know it had a funny name, um, correctional facility to then um, create a specialized area of the prison for 
people with uh, Alzheimer's and dementia so that they would be better cared for it, et cetera. So how this came about was they developed a whole training module for correction staff uh, about dementia uh, and Alzheimer's disease and what it is and how you respond and how you don't respond. And uh, at first, correction staff were very uh, resistant to participants. It's like a 40-hour training. Uh, might have been longer than that. It was at least a full week of, of training. And then the Alzheimer's wing, I guess you could say, was set up at the prison. And you would have to have that special training in order to um, be a corrections officer in that area of the prison. But as time has gone by, um, the officers love it and really prefer to work on that area, work in that area of the prison um, because once they became aware of, of Alzheimer's and dementia and how to better interact with people, then it's like, well, this is really, they consider it sort of the plum assignment um, because it's, it's much more sort of humanistic, it's much more interactive uh, than, than the rest of the prison is. But a lot of places aren't gonna be, don't wanna be kind of that, that progressive or it comes down to inmates themselves um, uh, helping other inmates. Yes. Yes. So they would, they would be and to and the interesting thing is whether they want to be or not, they're going to be at other not. prisons because um, the the more people that you're going to have with chronic illnesses or being frail or um, they're they're going to be whether they want to be or not. So um, uh, it brings up a lot of issues of uh, impairment in prison to begin with, um, or uh, frailty, um, and elderly prisoners, et cetera. How do we get off on that? I'm sorry. We didn't have <laughs> Yes. Right. 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 Exactly. Right. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, for some time, and he got to the point where he would not recognize her at all. But she was so committed, so dedicated, you know, she wants to eat his food, his child, every time she would go there with him. So, but little while he would talk to her, and then he would walk away without even recognizing her. So when he died, she was very heartbroken that he was also a child. Yes, was yes, and that's something from the statewide study, um, family caregivers talked about um, in, in a few of the open-ended qu um, answer question pieces of the, the instruments and the conflicted feelings about feeling really guilty but feeling just this, this stress has been, you know, taken off their shoulders and um, and even during the, the active caregiving phase, um, being very um, revealing and sort of saying, you know, there are days when 
it's like, can't this just be over? It just goes on and on and on. And then I feel really bad that I feel that way. And so it's, oh my goodness, that's so, and seeing that sort of like, oh, you can almost sort of see that, the, the, the sense of stress being lifted off of them when their family member does die, even though they're so conflicted about like, oh, I shouldn't feel that way, but. Um, Okay. Okay. So I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what do I have to look for? Fine. <laughs> Right. Uh, trying to play the chicken because one was playing with sheep. Uh, but you do, you know, just different things. And, and mother wasn't physically able to go out and look for him. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the thing. But um, hear, caring for him finally got her down. And he had to go to the hospital and get two days and then weeks to help us figure out we can go home, but we can't see the chicken in the cage. So we, they went to a nursing home, supposedly for the winter. Ah. And uh, right after Christmas came in in October, I felt his touch for the first time since October. Today. Yeah. Well, today's my birthday, so they moved in like. Oh, Christmas. happy birthday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> his birthday. His birthday. Ah. But they moved in the 21st of October for his birthday. Uh, he celebrated it at the nursing home. But, uh, and now I have a question about that. Uh, but, oh. They it's supposed to be for the winter. Yeah. Yeah. And after Christmas, he crawled out of bed with an extended at night because he would go out and wander. And he crawled out of these things and out of bed and crawled under the steps and got him down the stairs in. And the, you know, the, the five weeks, the five days that he was in the hospital, the six weeks that he was in the wheelchair, he could all have walk. So he never walked. Walked again. So, you know, we can feel it. And in, in 20 years ago, there were no support. Exactly. Right, right. And you didn't really want to do that to find out how many and I knew. Right. And you know, in, in my home we just used to have our little program that the Faith Conference and Health Today had all um, parent from kidney parents and, and that's what we were the processing was. And um, one of the things that and it was an RN program No. <laughs> know the funny thing is is that uh, I will never argue against the keeping your brain active and and all of the you know commercials now for 
all of these things to keep your brain active and oh yeah and that's good and that shows to slow the progression of this or help stave off that um, and then I, I thought to myself I kind of scratched my head I thought well wait a minute how come I've met so many people who were professors and doctors and I'm like wait a minute, especially with the younger onset. Um, so I thought, well, their brains were kept active and they got it. So um, I don't know, I don't know. Or if it seems like it hits harder because, um, because of, I don't know, how, how much they use their brain or I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. But I just know that, I, oh, well, keep your brain active. And I'm like shouting at the TV going, yeah, okay, but seriously, it, it's not going to prevent the disease if it's... Well, it's just to keep them very safe right. and I use them or lose them. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the dementia and Alzheimer's work uh, I think overall has affected me very positively. I mean, there's some negative of it. I think, oh my God, what if I, ooh, my parents are, ooh. but um, especially like my earlier uh, Alzheimer's research was in uh, uh, dementia residence uh, settings and had to do with um, um, uh, home and perception of home and concept of home and memories of home. Um, and um, I didn't know at first what that was going to be like. I was really nervous, and uh, but then I ended up loving that time in some twisted backwards way. Um, but I really, I truly, I felt like every day I thought I feel like I'm like, you know, the the Buddhist scholar here, <laughs> and really it's like this is forcing me to be in the moment, connecting with you as a human being. You don't really know me. I don't know you. It doesn't matter if you think I'm your sister. If I made you feel good today and you smiled, well, there was something really valuable about that interaction. That said, I haven't had family members with Alzheimer's disease or dementia, so so I haven't seen it up close. Um, and I'm not the family member of that person who knows what they were like before the disease. And, um, hello, we're just finishing up the last session. No, come on, sit down, it's okay. Um, and uh, so I think uh, I, it's made me also much more aware of sadness and loss. Uh, the prison stuff, I think, hit me harder um, in, in some ways in terms of, um, my own mental, um, my own mental well-being, but the Alzheimer stuff is just, um, it's hard, but it's also like enlightening, and somehow I find it sort of spiritually fulfilling to, to, to be researching in that area, so. So that's basically my answer of how it's affected me. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you for coming.